Our third speaker in tonight's forum is the well-known Dr. Keith Winshuttle, um, graduated with first class honours in history from the University of Sydney in 1970. He's the editor of Quadrant magazine, the well-known Quadrant magazine, and the author of five books and numerous articles on Australian and British Empire history, including The Killing of History, 1994, and that's still in print, and it's now in its fourth edition. Welcome, Dr. Keith Winchapel, please. Thank you, David. It's nice to be uh, back in this forum, which um, I have um, pleasant memories of in the past. Now, in 1966, I was a first year undergraduate at the, at the University of Sydney, taking a degree in liberal arts. Um, for what I, I guess is the same reason people still enrol in liberal arts courses today. And at the time, I wanted to know the best that had been thought and said within Western civilization. And that year, I had um, all, my, <laughs> all my dreams come true. I had one of the great experiences of my life because uh, one of the books my history, history course required me to read was Edward Gibbon's The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And uh, if you read the, uh, the full version, the, 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 Pen the current Penguin, which I think is the best edition of it, it's about 3,000 pages. Well, I didn't read that. There was actually a Pelican um, edition published, uh, an abridged edition of 1,000 pages. That was, that was what I read. But still, it was, um, it was something that... Um, uh, it was the biggest single piece of, of reading that I did in my de undergraduate degree, and it was worth it. I, I, indeed, I felt it was an honour and a privilege to be introduced to this magnificent work and to have lecturers who told me what I should look for and what I should not miss, and, uh, and some, of the, um, some of the scholarship that had been done on, on Gibbon's work that um, revealed things that you, you wouldn't understand if you weren't a, a, a very knowledgeable reader. Now, in 1966, the Department of History at the University of Sydney was a politically conservative department, and its course offerings were those of a genuine liberal arts program. Today, like almost all the history departments in Australian universities, it is politically left-wing. For instance, the long-serving Professor of History and Dean of Arts at Sydney, who is now, I think, a Pro Vice-Chancellor, Stephen Garton, he made his career by following in the footsteps of the radical French postmodernist theorist and gay theorist Michel Foucault. And the staff appointments that, um, that Garten made over his long tenure um, reflect his political thinking. Uh, you don't get a job unless you're politically uh, not, not, um, not intimately on side, but nonetheless, um, if, you <clears throat> if you're somebody who, um, who is going to rock the left-wing boat, you don't get an appointment at the University of Sydney, nor at the University of Melbourne today, where the long-time communist Stuart McIntyre remains head of both arts and history. Um, now, the problem, that, as I see it, is, is not just whoops, the people of a certain political position appoint others of like opinion into teaching positions. The problem is, is actually much deeper than that. Uh, and so let me begin at the beginning. History is, is an intellectual discipline that goes back, as, a, as um, our first speaker said, to the ancient Greeks. And the first real historian, Thucydides, did a remarkable thing. He set out to distance himself from his own political system and to write a work that examined critically what happened to Greece in the Peloponnesian Wars. He not only told of his own side's virtues and victories, but of its mistakes and disasters. And, if those, and people who say that um, history is a cliché, which uh, unfortunately I think one of our speakers here has kind of repeated tonight, that history is the record of the, um, of the victors, well, in fact, the very first real history book was a record of the losers, because Thucydides was on the losing side. He was an Athenian, and the, and the, and the Spartans defeated the Athenians in the Peloponnesian War. But um, uh, Thucydides not only wrote from, from that perspective, uh, and he wrote to try and criticise his own society to say, you know, what, why do we lose? Where do we go wrong? Uh, which a lot, of, a lot of historians have done over the years. Uh, Thucydides also distanced himself from his own culture and religion. Uh, up until then, uh, most societies, had, uh, when they told about the origins, had told mythical tales um, that, um, that affirmed um, a, a people's place in the cosmos, their relationship with the land, with the gods, um, 
and um, and and um, they many of them had oracles or medicine men who pretended they could predict the future. And Thucydides said, um, "This is all rubbish. This this is not how the, how the world works. Um, he, he, we have to learn to learn about the course of human affairs. Um, you do not you don't cons consult sacred texts or prophets or the sanctioned scribes of the era. Rather, Thucydides said he would go out." and either witness events himself, which he did because he was, a, he was the commander of one of the Athenian uh, warships, um, he would either witness events himself or compiling evidence only from those, he said, I'm quoting, of whom I made the most careful inquiry. And he said that even then the truth was, was not easy to come by uh, because people misremembered um, certain details and, um, and other people remembered the same events quite, quite different ways. But um, the role of the historian he said was to sort out what was true from what was what was myth, what was um, what was faulty memory from from um, reliable um, memory, and, and then draw conclusions which could be supported by the evidence. Uh, in short, what was remarkable about Thucydides and those who followed him was that they made a clean break with myths and legends, and instead they defined history as the pursuit of the truth about the past. Now, the ability to stand outside your own political system uh, and your own culture to criticise your own society and to pursue the truth is something that we today take so much for granted that it's almost part of the air we breathe. Without it, our idea of freedom of expression would not exist or Orwell's would be worthless. We should recognise, however, that this is a distinctly Western phenomenon. It's part of the cultural heritage of those countries, in particular Europe, the Americas and, and Australasia, that have evolved out of ancient Greece, Rome and Christianity. This idea was never produced by either Confucian or Hindu culture. Uh, under Islam it had a brief life in the 14th century, but was never heard of again. So rather than take the idea of history for granted, we should regard it as a rare and precious legacy that's our job to nurture and to pass on to future generations. Now, for most of the last 2,000 years, that, um, that um, call has been, has been honoured by most historians. Um, the essence of history has, con has continued to be that historians should try to discover the truth. Uh, over this time, of course, many historians have been exposed as mistaken, opinionated, and sometimes completely wrong. But until comparatively recently, their critics felt obliged to show they were wrong about real things, that their claims about the past were different to what had actually happened. In other words, the critics still operated on the assumption that the truth was in their grasp, within their grasp. Today, these assumptions are widely questioned, even among some people employed as historians themselves. Uh, many theorists of cultural studies and of social and cultural history tell us that it's impossible to tell the truth about the past or to use history to produce knowledge in any, in any objective sense at all. We can only see the past through the lens, of, uh, through the perspective of our own culture. And let me summarise the prevailing assumptions, of which I think I've got five, yes. The first one is, that, um, is, is an assumption that truth is not an absolute con concept but a relative one, especially about human affairs. Different cultures and even different political positions each have their own truths. What's the truth about, um, about the um, budget that was delivered last week, um, you might ask. Uh, um, that's the sort of example that people I'm, I want to criticise would, would put up. Secondly, they argue that history cannot give us any knowledge in an absolute sense. Different ages reinterpret the past for their own purposes. Third, we do not have any access, sorry, we do not have access to any such thing as a real world. What we think of as reality is a construct of our own minds, our language and our culture. Fourth, the meaning of any text, and that's um, a, a history book that's written recently or the, a document um, deep in the past that you have to find by going through the sort of research that Susan has done, the, his, the meaning of any text is in the eye of the interpreter. People of different ethnic, sexual and cultural backgrounds will read historical evidence in their own way. 
and that way will be different to people from other perspectives. And fifth, um, history is thus not fundamentally different to myth or to fiction, and there are people who actually publish books on this subject. In fact, the University of Melbourne, um, um, oh God, what's, his, what's his name? Um, McPhee, Peter McPhee, um, who used, was a professor of history there, I think he's now going to become a pro vice chancellor. He said, um, "History is is you, you, to be a, to write history. You you write history like it's like a novel, isn't it? and and, it's, and the work of a historian is very little different um, on the French Revolution, which is his specialty, uh, whether it's written by a, 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 a fiction writer or by a historian. Uh, when when historians look at past cultures, they this perspective says they cannot be objective, nor can they can they escape from the cocoon of their own politics or culture." And what historians see in the past, therefore, are their own values and interests reflected back at them. Now, I want to argue that um, that uh, these five ideas are, uh, they constitute a, a big mistake and are a totally wrong direction. And the first problem is a is a philosophical one. Uh, in, in my books, I usually give a well, I've got an, a very old example of one historian. Who's now retired? Um, used to, she used to be UTS and uh, ANU at San Curtois. Who said, um, "Today we can have um, um, we, the, we we have no um, idea. We have no belief that truth is um, is." Um, I'm I'm, misqu I'm worried about misquoting her, uh, but it, there are no absolute truths. Is basically what what she's she's argued. Um, the trouble is, um, if if Anne had done philosophy one at Sydney University. She would have found that that's that's a ridiculous thing to say, because uh, it's a, it's a, a, an inherent contradiction. Um, if there are no absolute truths, then the statement, "quote There are no absolute truths," cannot itself be true. It's simply logically impossible to argue that there are no absolute truths. But you don't have to do philosophy to um, to work that out. Um, there are absolute truths in history that all of us, everyone in this room knows, um, and, and these are these are not um, they, they, these are contingent truths. They're, they're things that are they're about facts about the world. For instance, uh, the fact that John Howard was elected pr uh, Prime Minister of Australia in 1996 and he was defeated as Prime Minister of Australia in 2007 are facts, absolute truths about Australian history that um, that um, Australia could not be the same country. Um, things would have been different in, in our lives, either big ways or little ways, if that, um, if that um, period of, of Liberal government ha had not happened. Um, and similarly, there's, there's big historical truths. If you're writing, uh, some people say, oh, look, uh, some of the people who argue this say, oh, yes, well, there's little facts like that, there's, little, there's a few dates and things, but they're really not the big, um, the big conclusions of history. Well, if you're writing a history of the Second World War, and um, you end up in, uh, in, in a bunker in Berlin and Hitler um, um, committing, and his girlfriend committing suicide, um, then the conclusion of your story about um, World War II in Europe is that Germany lost the war. It's a very big conclusion and it's an absolute truth as well. Um, you would literally have to be crazy to want to, 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 want to, um, to, want to deny it. And um, um, there's um, pretty well every war. It, 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 there's a lot of wars where the conclusion is where there's no conclusion. It's, the, the result is inconclusive. But when a country says yes, we surrender. Yes, we are defeated. We and yes, um, you, the, you can send the um, USS Missouri into Tokyo Bay, and we will sign a, a surrender and uh, and uh, terms of peace, and we'll give our prime minister and our top general <coughs> to the Americans so they can be executed. That is um, an absolute defeat in, in a war. Um, and, um, and and it's such an obvious point, but um, most people pick up things like are oh, the causes of World War World War One. When I was at high school, I wrote um, I wrote at least one essay. I can't remember. But I know I read at least one essay, one exam question on the causes of World War One. It was one of those one of the big topics we did, in which I was I always got good marks at. When I went to university, I wrote um, I did a modern history course, and I wrote more about World War One. Uh, as editor of, of Quadra magazine this this year, I'm still publishing articles um, on the cause, what were the causes of World War One. It's one of those topics that may never be resolved, but nonetheless, um, it doesn't mean it, you, you, if you say, well, then there's no truth in history. We can never know the truth. 
Um, there, there are some debating points which that might be true. The, the Courses of the Industrial Revolution is another one which all my life I've read the literature and, um, and, and uh, there's still you know, huge debates and, and lots of room for contention. But um, the idea that there are no truths in history is an absurdity and uh, the role of the historian is to find, is to find good evidence that, that, that constructs a truth for us uh, and that is tested by, by time. And, uh, and, but sometimes it's simply a matter of opening your eyes and, and looking at the world um, and seeing the, who, who is the current leader of your, of your country. Uh, these are historical facts. They're not things that um, happened so long ago. As Susan said, there are some, some, uh, in, in some details which we have very fragmented information about. And you, it, is, it is putting a, 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 together a jigsaw puzzle. Um, one, of the thing, one of the chapters in Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which some people argue is his most brilliant chapter, it's the reign of one emperor who I can't re for the moment remember. But all that's left of that emperor's reign, and that's in, in, um, in the period AD, it's after, it's after um, well he's an emperor, so it's after the Republic, obviously, is gone. But, but um, sometime around about, th about, about 200, all we have left are a few coins. Now Roman coins are very evocative because they have, they have um, uh, they celebrate victories, and often they give the date for the victory, and they tell you who won usually, um, um, and um, and sometimes they will uh, put in place, they put up, they will etch out on the coin um, buildings that were constructed as um, as triumphal memoirs, and and Gibbon has written a, a long chapter about this emperor uh, on the strength of a of a few. Um, coins that have been discovered about him. Actually, when that was given around the 18th century, now we know a lot more about the same guy, but everyone, uh, in fact, the, the, everyone says, look, look, you know, Gibbon got a few things wrong, as you would, but nonetheless, it's, a, it's, it's still a very, um, it's amazing, all the people who write about it now say it's amazing that Gibbon could, could get as far, much information right as he did um, on the basis of such, such flimsy evidence. Uh, but look, um, I, I, I'm digressing. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to really talk about philosophy or justify the use of truth in history because I think it's it's almost um, well it's it, it's certainly worth talking about but um, but it's it, it's such an easy hit as well. But what I, I think is the worst thing that's gone wrong with with um, history today is that um, is the notion derived from those five points that all history is politicised. That is, we only we're, when we do history we are p pursuing our own interests and our own perspectives and we see the world. The way we want to see it, or the way we'd like it to be, um, or we twist characters in a certain way to make them um, people who we like or we don't like, depending on our political perspectives. Now, I think this has become one of the most corrupting influences of all. It's turned the traditional role of the historian to stand outside his contemporary society, as Thucydides did, in order to seek the truth about the past on its head. It's allowed historians to write from an overtly partisan position. It's led them to make things up and to justify this to themselves on the grounds that it's all for a good cause. And um, Australia's best known author of Aboriginal history, Henry Reynolds, has written in justification of his own, um, his own pursuit of that objective, uh, and I'll quote him, he says, history should not only be relevant, but politically utilitarian. It should aim to right old injustices, to discriminate in favour of the oppressed, to actively rally to the cause of liberation. Uh, in, in, a, in a debate I got into with Henry uh, um, over the publication of my series, The Fabrication of Aboriginal History, um, I was accused of lacking compassion, that uh, the historian needs to be compassionate. And I said, no, 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 the historian should be dispassionate. Um, the, once you start becoming compassionate, you start, you wear your heart on your sleeve and you start seeing things through certain rosy, rose-coloured glasses that, um, that distort what's really going on and um, again if you want to be objective and tru truthful then you have to discard voting for one side, um, preferring certain people and starting out with aims to, um, as Henry says, to discriminate in favour of the oppressed and to actively rally to the cause of liberation. I mean who defines what liberation is um, um, in these cases? This was a notion that originated in the 1960s, in, in the era when I was an undergraduate, and um, for a long part of my adult life I certainly supported all these uh, ideas. It was originally developed in order to open up scholarship so that all those voices allegedly excluded from traditional history could be heard. 
Its supporters told us that their version of history would open up the field to women, blacks and ethnic minorities who, I'm quoting, have suffered discrimination, exploitation and hostility, but have overcome passivity and resignation to change their exploiters, to fight for legal rights and to resist and cross racial boundaries. Unquote. And today this view is enshrined in the Australian National Curriculum where students are told one of the central objectives of historical investigation is to identify those groups of people in the past who have suffered oppression from those in authority. Children are, are taught that Western civilization has been the source of serious persecution on the grounds of race, ethnicity and gender. Um, however, the, the curriculum as it's written is politically selective. In the modern history section of the syllabus, there's plenty of scope for teachers to criticise Western society for its alleged racism and sexism, but there is nothing at all about the far worst oppressions of the modern era, for example, under Joseph Stalin or Mao Zedong. The new syllabus never mentions Christianity's defining role in Western civilization, except as a minor cultural issue, when teachers are expected to consider the effects on Africa and Asia of racism, religion and European culture. Now, it's not surprising the curriculum takes this line because the result, it's the result the Gillard government wanted. It appointed a team headed by Stuart McIntyre, as I said, is the Professor of History at, at um, the University of Melbourne and um, a long-time member of both the Communist Party of Great Britain and the Communist Party of Australia, and has written six books on Marxism, Communism and Communists. In other words, the national curriculum in history has become a tool to make left-wing politics the only perspective from which school, school children and university students can view the past. Now, left-wing historians justify this by openly admitting they want to see the end of traditional history. And, and um, although I, I, I'm you know, appropriately impressed by our, our two speakers today, I think they did um, kind of um, um, disparage traditional history a little. I don't think traditional history was remembering a list of dates or a list of wars. Um, I, I did history at high school and university. Certainly at high school, I never learned one list of dates. Um, um, and, and I went to a state high school and, and it was the ordinary New South Wales curriculum. And, um, and I did it for the Leaving Certificate in, in 1959. Um, there was no dates. It was, um, it was argumentative. Um, we taught, we told that we need to, um, we need to, um, you know, the Australian history is, is uh, focused on the British Empire and, um, and the glories of, um, of a, a, an imperial era that's now past. Well, you know, I, I did the honours course in, in 1959 in, um, in the Leaving Certificate and, my, and the whole field I did was Chinese history, uh, modern Chinese history. We did the fall of the Manchu dynasty, we did the Republic, Sun Yat-sen, Chiang Kai-shek, and I, uh, we stopped in, in 1949 when Mao took over we didn't go into that because there, no, there were not many books written then because it was only a decade after that happened. But nonetheless, um, it was, um, I, I learned an awful lot about Chinese history then that um, has stood me in good stead most of my life. So the idea that um, you know, we need, need to, uh, to give a communist like McIntyre the job of writing the national curriculum because it's, it's supposedly focused on uh, cheerleading for the British Empire is just not my experience at all. And, um, uh, or, or the generation of people that I, I was at school with and, and, and at university with. Um, but look, the, the point of a view that, um, that, um, that all different viewpoints, all, non, um, uh, all the views of the oppressed and the, um, and the victims of society ha ha have different views to those of the political leaders and the political victors of history, um, it, 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 it's, there's, a, there's a problem with that, that particular point of view. Um, and, and I think it's, it's um, self-defeating for the aims of those people who, who want, like Henry Reynolds, to pursue the cause of liberation for all the oppressed groups of the world. Because uh, it, if, when, when you, when you legitimise a multiplicity of, of voices and you undermine the concept of truth, then... Um, um, then it's not difficult to show that the politicisation of history undermines the aims of interest groups like um, ethnics, blacks and gays, um, because by abandoning truth and objectivity, you unwittingly validate political positions that your, your victim groups uh, might find less congenial, because 
um, if, if they have um, the right to the truth of their own history, then so do white supremacists, so do ethnic cleansers, so do homophobes, so do the worst people in the world, <laughs> according to our current legal system, misogynists. They, they, their views suddenly become leg legitimate because all perspectives of all cultures uh, cannot be criticised by those who are not members of those cultures. And, uh, and one of the great things that history did was in fact to discriminate against certain people, to say this was, this was a disastrous policy, this was the wrong way to go, this was a big mistake for human beings. Uh, the only thing I can see in the, um, in, in the <laughs> national curriculum um, is, 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 is that um, students have now been told that the big mistake that um, humanity made uh, was to in fact abandon hunter-gatherer society for agriculture. And, um, and if, you, if, you don't, if you think this is absurd, uh, we have the lead, lead article in Quadrant in our, uh, in our May edition, where an examination of the, the history textbooks that students are, are being forced to read as part of this new curriculum, and that's precisely a point that one of, I think, the Pearson um, history of, of whatever it is um, um, makes, that, um, um, you know, you shouldn't just be standing up and, and acknowledging the Gadigal people or whoever once, 200 years ago, used to walk on these shores, um, you have to say, they were right. They had, that, they had the uh, best solution to um, the human condition and, um, and what fools we to the invented modern machines and antibiotics and, um, and, um, and, and hospitals that, um, that you know, keep babies alive once they're born. What, what fools we to uh, pursue modernity? Um, that's that's one of the logical conclusions. Is that for me? No. no that's uh, <laughs> parliamentary. No, no, no. Parliamentary. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not called, David. Anyway, um, there's a debate going on about the repeal of um, Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, and uh, the Jewish community is saying, "Well, look, this this will um, uh, if you repeal 18C, that means you open the open the floodgates for." People who want to deny the Holocaust. Well, um, um, I mean, if you if you take the cultural relativism of the Australian history curriculum and of the dominant views in the academic teaching of history today, then you'll have to um, you'll have to accept that um, David Irving is the probably the leading historian who denies the Holocaust happened, and who is has been proven to be. You know, disreputable, sleazy liar by um, by Richard Evans of Cambridge University, who wrote a book called Telling Lies About About Hitler, which proved that it, that Irving is just is a totally discredited person. But if you um, if if you accept that all interest groups uh, or cultural groups have their have their own truths, then David Irving's work um, has to be recognised as a legitimate expression of a neo-Nazi, white supremacist, blah blah, whatever else you want to call him. Um, the only way to um, to to discover the truth about um, about oppression and um, and um, racism and um, misogyny and other things that um, we certainly know have occurred in our past um, is to have a regime based upon freedom of speech and unfettered research. In other words, you have to do traditional history the way that Thucydides did. You have to. You can't assume that. Um, that um, that um, e every perspective is valid. You have to find out that some people are wrong about what the, about the past, and some people create myths about the past. In fact, I think it's almost a, a, a human nature for people to want to create myths about the past. All right, David, do you want me to go on? Or, 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 I, don't, I haven't mentioned the Aboriginal history stuff, but. I think I'm, I'm getting a bit too too far into it, eh? Um, I think in the procedure of the meeting we might give the question as a go, if that's all right with you, uh, okay. because of parity of time. Okay, let me just, just, just say one final thing. Um, look, I thought Susan's example of, um, of the critique of, um, of um, Robert uh, Hughes on, um, on the orgy that happened on, on, um, at Farm Cove um, when the Lady Penryn uh, docked, um, it, it is absolutely right. Uh, a lot of historians, and I find this in, 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 in the Aboriginal history, which I've written quite a lot about in, in the last decade, um, you have people who want to tell a certain kind of story, they go cherry-picking the evidence, 
that for points that support their case, uh, in some cases they manipulate the evidence, change the words of what people said in the past, or they make it up as, um, you know, slippery couplings along the rocks. I hadn't heard that one before. <laughs> but it is very uh, evocative. It, it's a pity it's not true, in a way, you know. Um, but it's a, it, it's, it's a fiction writer taking over. And um, in, in the histories of, um, of, um, of, fr of so-called frontier warfare, I mean, students in, in year, I think it's year 10 now, have to spend one third of Australian history course uh, on frontier conflict. And uh, I've been going through all the records of the historians who've created the, the story about frontier conflict and have found, um, initially to my surprise, but now, to, now no surprise at all to me, there was no frontier conflict. Um, there were a few small cases of robbery which are beaten up, which are beaten up into warfare. There uh, is one case, somebody mentioned Grace Caskins, is uh, a book The Colony. Well, it's in many ways it's a nice book, but the stuff on Aborigines is just hopeless. Um, she says the Aborigines used to set, set fire to the wheat fields all the time, and, and there's one in 1805. In December, they set fire to the wheat fields again. Well, I've gone through all the records she's looked at. Not one wheat field in, in Sydney, she's talking about Sydney and the Hawkesbury, not one wheat field was ever set on fire. And there's one where she quotes in December the wheat fields are set on fire again, and you look at the source. It's a case where some Aborigines did attempt to um, set fire to a wheat stack, um, but the, the story in the Sydney Gazette says um, the, um, the settler, the farmer of the, of the place, um, went out with his gun and they all ran off. Uh, the wheat fields were not burnt. Um, and um, um, there's people will, who, who are determined to pursue a certain kind of line will pick up on the slightest um, piece of evidence that they can to make the jigs to fill in the middle, middle part of the jigsaw the way they think the picture should look. Um, in, in, in cases where all you have is the, is the four corners of the jigsaw and a couple of you know, blocks on the side, you have to say, we don't know very much about this. A lot of this is supposition. You can't just go, go in and say, uh, well, the Aborigines would have thought like we do in the, in the 20th century, the 21st century, um, and acted. Uh, they, were, they were acting in, in, when Australia was first founded in the 18th century. They met 18th century Europeans. And um, and um, and they they were they were not people. I mean, the, the story about Aborigines comes out of the 1960s again, um, from my generation of people who saw who, who thought that the Viet Cong and the Khmer Rouge were sort of revolutionary guerrilla warriors who were heroes, and who for a time there we wanted to win against the imperial forces of the United States and the rest of it. Um, but, they, but in Aboriginal history, that, um, that idea that um, everyone will defend their land um, uh, as, as guerrilla warriors, even if they haven't got any weapons, um, and they'll, they'll have frontier warfare, um, it's, that, that's a concept that comes from the 20th century. It's not a concept that comes from 18th century, um, 18th century uh, Australian and British history. And if you do go into um, Aborigines' attitudes to white people and Aborig who, who they thought they were, what they thought they were doing here, and, and, and that, that sort of information is in fact now, there's quite a rich um, literature in that field, um, the idea that they would be, um, in fact they, they thought they were the ghosts of their relatives, and um, that, that's not a myth, I once thought, oh that's a myth, no one would really think that, but in fact they did really think that, it was widespread in Australia. And, um, and uh, many of them identified some of the white convicts as being, oh, that's Uncle Joe's long lost brother. He's come back um, as this white man. And there are stories of, of convicts who settled within Aboriginal um, uh, tribes or clans who had relationships with women, who, um, who, who in fact did lead some Aboriginal groups in, in, in raids who were more like stealing than warfare. Um, and you think, well, oh, that's, that sounds like a bit of a myth to me, you know, why would they do that? Well, when you actually understand Aboriginal attitudes, what they thought about the white people, you, it all suddenly starts, it fits a different picture entirely. And um, you simply can't transpose the idea of, of um, French-educated Vietnamese and French-educated Cambodians, Paris-educated in, in, in those cases, like... Pol Pot and, and Ho Chi Minh, um, who decided to launch imperial wars against um, first the French and then the Americans, you can't simply say, oh, the Aborigines must have done that too. They were the first guerrilla warriors. 
it is um, it's it's an abrogation of the duty that we have as historians, and yet the whole national curriculum tells tens of thousands of students every year that that's what happened.